In ancient accounts of medicine, there is no mention of meningitis. Not a word either from Hippocrates, the Greek father of modern medicine, or Avicenna, the great medieval Persian scholar. It would take until the 18th century for Scottish physician Robert Witt to study meningitis and provide a description of the disease in 1768. The beginning of the 19th century saw the first outbreaks strike humankind. The first in Geneva in 1805 was followed by others in Europe and the United States. Africa has been regularly affected by major epidemics since 1840. By the end of the 19th century, medical knowledge began at last to advance. In 1885, Austrian bacteriologist Anton Weichelbaum was the first to describe meningococcus, the bacterium that causes the disease. At the time, meningococcus killed 80% of its victims. The first line of defense in treating the disease was introduced in 1914, when American pathologist Simon Flexner succeeded in curing patients with recently developed anti-serum therapy. Anti-serum therapy consisted of injecting a serum taken from immunized animals, such as horses, into the patient's tissues. But the truly decisive weapon was yet to come, the much-famed penicillin. Discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928, the antibiotic began to be used extensively during World War II. But there were still no vaccines until the development of what are called polysaccharides in the 1970s. Meningitis hit troops hard during the Vietnam War, so the U.S. Army decided to routinely immunize its recruits with polysaccharide vaccine. The fight against meningococcus was stepped up in the 2000s with the development of new conjugate vaccines. Unlike previous vaccines, these vaccines protect against four of the five bacteria that cause most meningitis. In 2010, Menafrovac, the most recent conjugate vaccine, dealt a decisive blow to meningitis in Africa. A battle won against the bacteria, yes, but the war is not over yet. Meningitis is under control in most of the world's regions, with the exception of what is known as the meningitis belt in Africa. The meningitis belt is an area of land stretching from Senegal to Somalia, where 400 million people live. Every year during the December to June dry season, Sub-Saharan Africa is affected by bacterial meningitis. Occurring in 10-year cycles, meningococcal meningitis appears in waves of major outbreaks. Meningitis statistics dating back to 1970 show that the 1996 epidemic was particularly dangerous. 250,000 people contracted the disease and 25,000 died, making it the most deadly meningitis epidemic in history. Between 1995 and 2004, there were almost 700,000 cases of meningitis in the Belt countries and 60,000 deaths. The future looks brighter, however, since 2014, when the number of cases reported during the African dry season was at its lowest level in 10 years. In 2010, the World Health Organization, or WHO, had launched a vast immunization campaign and rolled out a new vaccine, Menafrovac, which provides better protection and is cheaper. During the campaign, between 2010 and 2014, over 150 million people were vaccinated in 10 meningitis belt countries. In Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Cameroon, Chad, Nigeria, Ghana, Benin, Senegal, and Sudan. Three years later, the results were conclusive. 
Whereas during the dry season in 2010, over 15,000 people had contracted the disease, less than half, around 6,000 cases, were reported to the WHO in 2014. But there are two regrettable exceptions, Guinea and South Sudan. Neither country has started using the new vaccine yet. In France, 46 meningitis deaths were reported in 2012. Meningitis stems from the word meninges, the three protective membranes that surround the brain and protect the nervous system. Meningitis is an infection of the meninges caused by a variety of microorganisms. One of these is Neisseria meningitidis, more commonly known as meningococcus. Divided into several strains with similar characteristics, the meningococcal bacterium has spawned its very own macabre alphabet. Meningitis A, B, C, W135, and even X and Y. A highly contagious killer, meningococcal meningitis A is responsible for most epidemics in Sub-Saharan Africa. In West Africa, meningitis is propelled by the harmaton, a very dry wind that blows during the dry season. The harmaton carries dust particles that cause lesions in the nose, which help the meningococcal bacteria to breach the mucous membranes and enter the bloodstream. The bacteria pass directly from one person to another through kissing, sneezing, or simply sharing a glass or by sleeping in the same room. Once in the blood, the meningococcal bacteria make their way to the blood-brain barrier, which separates the central nervous system from the bloodstream. The barrier's role is to protect the brain against attacks by pathogens or germs. But the blood-brain barrier isn't flawless, and the meningococcal bacteria can pass through and advance to the brain, where they cross into the cerebrospinal fluid and multiply, causing swelling and infection of the meninges. One to four days later, the first symptoms appear. These include stiffness of the neck, fever, intense headaches, confusion, and lethargy. When the disease doesn't kill, it can lead to serious neurological damage, such as learning difficulties, brain lesions, and loss of hearing. To defeat meningitis, you have to intervene early. Even if a patient receives treatment one or two days after symptoms appear, they have a 1 in 10 chance of dying. After a preliminary examination, a lumbar puncture is performed to confirm the diagnosis. A sample of cerebrospinal fluid is taken, fluid where waste products from the brain are evacuated. In addition, a blood sample is examined. Often, a rapid look under the microscope is sufficient. If not, the sample is cultured to identify the bacteria causing the disease and to know which antibiotics to use. Diagnosis is complicated and difficult to conduct in resource-limited settings. In the African meningitis belt, the necessary resources, a laboratory, materials for lumbar puncture, trained personnel, are only found in big cities. To treat the disease, antibiotics are available, such as ceftriaxone, which is effective even after a single dose. But the best way to control the rapid spread of this killer is to stop it in its tracks, with a vaccine. Since the 2000s, what are called conjugate vaccines have become available. When the weakened bacteria in a classic vaccine isn't enough to provoke the development of antibodies against the disease, 
combining the bacteria with a protein reinforces the effectiveness of the now conjugated vaccine. This process is especially effective for children under two years of age. In 2010, the WHO launched Menafravac, a revolutionary conjugate vaccine. For the past four years, it has been widely used in mass vaccination campaigns in the meningitis belt. Menafravac provides better and longer lasting protection, reduces the risk of transmission, and is much less expensive than previous vaccines. Meningitis is a disease that mainly affects children, but it can also affect adults. We get it during the dry season when it's very hot. It can paralyze children. They lose the use of their legs. It can make them deaf or deaf and dumb. It can even cause brain damage. We heard about the vaccination campaign on TV and on the radio. They said it will protect us for 10 years. But this miraculous vaccine does still present some problems. Menafravac, administered by intramuscular injection, must be given by skilled health workers, whose numbers are often limited in regions where meningitis is common. And even though Menafravac is relatively heat tolerant, it must still be kept in the cold chain, so to get it to the arms of those in need remains an expensive endeavor. I manage a team of around eight people. We work specifically on diseases caused by meningococcal bacteria. These bacteria cause meningitis, an extremely severe infection of the brain. The bacteria live inside the throat and from time to time enter into the bloodstream and this is when the disease proper starts. We've shown that the bacteria bind to the wall of blood vessels and it's from there that they cross the blood-brain barrier, enter the brain itself and cause meningitis. The tools we are using are in vitro tools which means they are cell cultures that we incubate with bacteria. We observe what happens, studying both the molecular and cellular levels over time. We also work on animal models, which will help us to put these cells in a physiological context, in the body of an animal, allowing us to study it in a more realistic context. Finding ways to reproduce the infection as it occurs in humans in a controlled environment, so in the laboratory, is a crucial step. The capacity of the bacteria to interact, to bind to the endothelium, the cells that form the vessel wall, is a key point. And if we can develop treatments that can block this process, that can stop it from happening, then we should have a better way to treat the disease. What we know how to do is to analyze what is happening. And once we understand some key stages, we'll reach out to commercial laboratories who can then develop medications.